Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. Well, praise the Lord. It's good to be here today. And some of you will know me, some of you don't, obviously, but um, there's a lot of people running around in the room that I have known for many, 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 many years. And so just give me a second to get set up here. As Beth has already said, um, I've known her since she was pretty small. In fact, since she was born, I think. And uh, I first came to Edmonton in 1996. Um, I preached in this church when the stage was as high as that black line right there. And um, there was enough steps that if you would have fallen down, you'd have thought you were in Giza. And uh, it was just a long ways. I remember having to come all the way down to like the third step just to kind of get to about the height I am now. And so, uh, and of course, I knew the first pastor here. I knew the second pastor here. I knew the third and the fourth pastor here. And I know the fifth pastor here. And so, um, but it's really great to see some of the people. Of course, Christian, I think, was about 12 when we moved to Edmonton and took over the church. And his parents were in there. His dad was running the sound. And so um, I just got a long history with the family, known Dustin now for several years. Not even sure how many, but it's been a while. They brought a team over to Chilliwack when we were pastoring there, where there was another denotter, <laughs> Sue, going to our church. And so praise the Lord. It's, uh, it's just good. The, the family connections are great. You know that? And... Uh, just, it seems like everywhere I go, I, I run into these guys, you know, they, when I first came to Edmonton, I think there was eight kids, and then they went and helped with the Sherwood Park Church plant, when they came back, there was ten, <laughs> and then they went over to St. Albert and helped with the church over there for a while, and then there was eleven, and then I think, out to Chilliwack to plant the church, and there was twelve. I was like, okay, I think I have that right, but it just seemed like I had to learn a whole new batch of names all the time. I was trying to think of them all here the other day. I thought, oh man, I don't want to get anybody's name wrong. My second service in Edmonton, I think uh, Sarah got ran over in the parking lot. It was just like, I have a long history with the family. And so it's, it's great. Just saw, uh, of course, mom and dad here. Boy, not even two months ago, I don't think. Two months ago at a wedding and uh, was able to have a chat and catch up with them. But praise the Lord. Um, as Beth has said, I'm the district overseer for the area. That's um, something that's fairly new. We formed a new district. And um, I actually work full-time for Victory Churches of Canada and took over the district here. So we blended the churches in Edmonton with, with the two churches in Red Deer and Three Hills and Airdrie and formed a district, Central Alberta District, and um, did that. I was just talking to Dr. George Hill about some of the stuff here Friday, I believe, and uh, he said, make sure you say hi to the congregation there for us. So uh, Dr. George and Hazel say hi. And at uh, any rate, turn with me in your Bibles to Nehemiah. Nehemiah, and we'll get into the Word. And so... Um, you know, I went to Lethbridge many years ago to pastor, and they invited me to come back and, uh, and, and preach. And when I got up to preach, they, they had a stopwatch, and it said 27 minutes. And I was like, oh, man, I don't even know if I can say hello in 27 minutes. But, uh, but praise the Lord. Has everybody found Nehemiah? Nehemiah chapter 4 and verses 15 through 23. And um, it's a really interesting portion of scripture here, but it says, and it happened when our enemies had heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. So it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at construction while the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and wore armor. And the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so with one hand they worked at construction and with the other hand they held a weapon. Every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built. And the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. 
Then I said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, and we are separated far from one another on the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So we labored in the work, and half of the men held spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. At the same time, I also said to the people, let each man and his servant stay at night in Jerusalem that they may be a guard by night and a working party by day. So neither I, my brethren, my servants, nor the men on guard who followed me took off their clothes except that everyone took them off for washing. I was glad that they put that on the end so that we understand that they, they were concerned with hygiene, but... This portion of scripture, and, and you're probably wondering what I'm going to draw out of it today, but, but this account of Nehemiah rebuilding this wall is actually incredible and has a, has a tremendous bearing on us as Christians in the rebuilding of churches especially. Because here you have this whole society of people that has now been under someone else's rule for a long period of time. Their homes are destroyed. The wall around their city has been torn down and it's laying there in ruins and Nehemiah gets the permission from his king to come back and begin rebuilding this wall. Now they do this feat in 52 days. 52 days. I'm just like, I can't even hardly get my head around this because it would take more time than that with all the construction equipment and the crews and the technology that we have today. And yet he was able to bring these people together and in this short period of time, bring security back to their city. Now they had enemies, right? And there was Sanballat and Tobiah, and what was the other guy, Geshem. These guys were all enemies of them. They wanted to take down what was being reconstructed. They even ridiculed them. They tried to bring fear upon them. They tried to lure Nehemiah into a meeting in the temple of God. Now, how many of you know the reasoning behind why Nehemiah would not go to that meeting. Certainly it was a trap, but not a trap as we think. It was a trap based in religious law. Nehemiah was a eunuch, and a eunuch could not enter into the temple of God. And so here they're trying to draw Nehemiah to come to a meeting in the temple where he knows that he would be violating Jewish law and he would lose his entire support base in that area. So understand there's a lot going on in this story where they're trying to destroy instead of build up. And this goes on in the church today and, and throughout our society. What is it I just read the other day? 96 churches now in Canada have been burnt or vandalized over the last few months, over the last year. Can you imagine 96 years, almost 100 churches in our nation have been burnt or vandalized to destruction and I haven't read one thing in the newspaper about it. See, we are in the process right now in our nation of having to rebuild our faith. You know, in the 1950s, 80%, over 80% of Canadians, almost 85% of Canadians believe that the Bible was the inerrant word of God. Today, it's less than 16%. So understand that, that we got a lot of rebuilding to do if we're going to get there. And the title of my message today is High Expectations. And I call it that because high expectations is what we need to have today. If we don't have high expectations, then what kind of expectation do we have? Because the same old, same old, or just good enough is not good enough for us to rebuild what needs to be rebuilt to gain our credibility back, to gain our foothold back, to, to rebuild the church as it needs to be built as this apostolic uh, evangelistic entity that brings people into the kingdom of God. Understand, hell is real. Heaven is real. I don't know. You don't want to be flipping a coin as to which one you're going to go to. And you don't want your relatives and your friends to be flipping a coin either. Right? You want them to know for certain what is ahead of them. And this is where I want to go today. You know, Hudson Taylor, I don't know how many of you have ever heard of Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor was a missionary to China. And, uh, and he originally went through, the, through the, the British Evangelistic Society. 
and, uh, and he went to China and he lived like an Englishman and he dressed like an Englishman and he, he did everything they told him he needed to do as a missionary and he never got one convert. So he came back to England, he left that missionary society and he founded his own missionary society and he went back to China and it took him six years dressing like the Chinese, eating their food, living in their communities and he finally won somebody to Jesus and when he did, revival broke out. And he began to win thousands and thousands and thousands of people to the Lord. He said this, I have found that there are three stages in every great work of God. First, it is impossible. Then it is difficult. Then it is done. Understand that what we're doing in the rebuilding of churches, at first you think it's impossible. It just can't be done. And then as you get rolling at it and God begins to bless you and bring people around you, then it's kind of difficult. You go through the difficult phase, and then one day you look out and you go, what happened? It's done. We have our footing back. We have our stronghold back. We have this rebuilding thing happening now, and it's going on right in front of us, and it doesn't even necessarily require us. It's going on its own. It's picked up momentum. It's picking up this momentum. And see, this is what Nehemiah was doing. He brought all of those people together, these people that were fragmented and distanced. And in one place, there was a, it talks about the Tekoa nobles, the Tekoite nobles. Didn't want to do the work. And he forced them into it. He literally forced them into it. He said, no, everybody's going to work. Everybody's going to work. And later on, as the book comes to an end, you find out that he actually had such a dispute with them that he tore out their beards, it says. (laughs) I'm like, he was serious about what needed to be done. He was deadly serious. It just can't happen by accident. You know, Mark 10, 27 says, but Jesus looked at them and said, with men, this is impossible, but not with God. With God, all things are possible. And so we need to realize that nothing is impossible for God. See, it's this type of an attitude that Nehemiah approached the rebuilding of this wall. It's this type of an attitude that we have to approach the rebuilding of everything we do. We have an enemy that's trying to tear it all down. Unfortunately, it happens from within more than it happens from without. But we have to be strong in the midst of it, draw people in, give them what they need to do the job, and then believe God for those high expectations. And, and, and put those on people. And so Nehemiah challenges. Nehemiah's challenges were great and seemingly impossible. I mean, think about it. He was a slave serving a king in a foreign land. He was a slave. It wasn't like he was a free man that could come and go as he wanted. He was a slave. But he goes to prayer. And he takes the situation to God. And then one day the king says to him, what's the matter? And he says, well... This is what the problem is. And the king says, well, okay, what do you need? What do you need to restore this back to your people? Well, I need letters. (laughs) I need soldiers. I need safe passage. He, He lays out everything he needs. And the king says, it's yours. I'll give it to you. Here you go. Go back and do this thing. But when will you return? He gives them a time limit. When, when are you going to return? I want to know when you're coming back. Understand he's a slave. See, in himself, he never had the resources to undertake or even underwrite such a task. It wasn't there. He just didn't have it. It wasn't even, wasn't even something that most people would have even dreamt about. But here he is on the edge of this situation that says, it's impossible. And he gets there and he walks through the ruins and he realizes, this is going to be difficult. <laughs> This is going to be really difficult. He says, he says that, that, that the rubble was so bad that they had to get off their animals and walk through it. They couldn't even take their animals. And here they are in the midst of this. He says, me and a few good men. Just a few good. That's all it took. We'll get this thing started with a few good, committed people. And this is where it started. And I look at it, I go, my goodness, what, a, what an undertaking. You see, he had powerful enemies. Oh man, they wanted things to stay just as they were. He had to deal with, with 70 years of cultural and, and philosophical destruction amongst his people. 70 years where they had been turned into something else. They had been changed from being Israelites to being Babylonians. 
Chaldeans. They were all mixed up. They didn't know who they were. And it took Nehemiah to come and reform them into who they were and put them to work on that wall. Now, is the wall important? Well, you know what? From a military standpoint, <laughs> he was still way outnumbered. But what it did was it signaled to the people, God is at work here. We're reestablishing our territory. We're reestablishing. And it talks about that wall being made up of burnt stones, burnt and broken stones. Man, it sounds like most churches to me. All right, we're all broken. We're all broken. My goodness, God's, if we're not broken, God will break us. <laughs> right? He wants, he wants to turn us into something else. And sometimes that takes some remolding. And then it breaks us, and then we get, whoo, we get chiseled away at us. It. Like, whoo, my goodness, I don't know if my pride can take this. And he says, that's good, that's the point. I don't want your pride in the way. I want you broken before me. You know, this, this rebuilding is, is, is not unlike what we have to do at the local church level. You know, Jesus said in, in Matthew 16, 18, he said, you know, that he would build his church and that the gates of Hades would not prevail against it. Most people don't know where this comes from. They don't think about it much. We read past this. But he's in a place called Caesarea of Philippi. And this is the base of Mount Hermon. Now, in the time that Jesus went there, it was actually called Baal Hermon. It was actually the throne of the god Baal. And there was a cave in this mountain which was home to the god called Pan. I don't have time to get into all, what all these gods were, but they were basically violence and sexual immorality and on and on and on, full sinfulness. So this cave to the god Pan had an entrance, and that entrance was known as the gates of hell. That was the gates of hell. And Jesus stood facing the crowd and said that is not going to prevail against this. It's not going to happen. And so as we look forward to rebuilding, we have to rebuild through the spreading of God's word. Because the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church that Jesus is building. This is the whole message that is being sent. And if they can stop the word, if they can stop the worship, and that worship was great. Man, I was just like, this is really good. This is really good. There was, there was a tremendous spirit of worship in the house. Now you've got some good musicians, of course. But you know what? It's, it's what comes out of here that makes the difference. And when you can feel that presence of God in the room, it doesn't matter who's playing. I mean, you can have the best musicians in the world, and there not be any spirit in it. But you can have a group of people who are committed to a cause. And it's like, man, heaven comes down. And so what you have here is the foundation that you can build upon and rebuild upon and generate forward. But it takes, it takes something. It takes this understanding that just like Nehemiah, we have to believe that this is possible. Even though it may seem impossible. First, it's impossible. My goodness, then it's difficult. Then it's done. I love this quote, and I have used it more times than you can even imagine. But Nehemiah partnered with God. Then he partnered with the people. And the task was completed. But you'll note that he partnered with God first. He can go to the people first. He partnered with God first. He heard about the problem. He went to God and he said, God, you're the one with the solution. The king said, what do you need? So he just talked about all that he would need. I need, I need letters to get lumber. I need this. These are all the things I need. Okay, go there. But when he got there, what he really needed was those people. Wasn't it? That's what he needed. They could provide everything else. He got the safe passage he needed to get there. He had God partnering with him. And what was impossible two months before now was just difficult. And then one day they stood on that wall and they realized it was done. 52 days. 
we have got this thing built. And so this is the nature of partnering with Jesus to build the local church. I mean, it can seem like, whoo, this is an insurmountable mountain. But we just have to remember that Jesus stood right in front of the gates of hell and said it can't prevail against what I will build, because what I will build is better than what sin builds. What I build is better than what the devil has to offer. And that is life in Christ. And this is what we have to grab onto. If we want to rebuild, and, and trust me, I don't preach this exact same message, but I preach the message that today, more than ever, in the history of our nation, if our churches are not redemptively oriented... If they do not have an evangelistic thrust to them to bring new converts into the kingdom, then they are destined to fail. Absolutely destined to fail. They will continue to decline. I was talking to a gentleman on Friday who I've known for many, many years. And, uh, and he's affiliated with a group of churches. And they have just lost their last presbyter. Has left the country, retired somewhere. And they're left leaderless. These, these churches, there's only about five of them in all of Canada now. The rest have diminished and disappeared. And there's a particular ethnic group that they come from. And he said, he said, as a pastor, I have to have a service in their language, even though they've lived in Canada for 60 years, most of them, because they don't think that they can receive from God in a different language. But he said it's down to about 15 or 20 of those people. He said, we got 225, 250 that come to the, the regular service. But he said, I cannot move them. I cannot shake them. And the, serve, the, the board won't allow us to merge them with the other service. So he said, I have to continue to reach that group that is never, ever, ever going to catch the fire of the gospel. They're done. They're at the end of their game. So he said, all I can do is look for someone to adopt us in that can bring that apostolic evangelistic thrust back into our psyche, into our mindset. Otherwise, all of these churches are gone. That's a sad, sad testimony. But as I look around throughout Christendom, I'm here to tell you that the churches that are doing the best, not just in Canada or the United States, but on an international scale, the ones that are doing the best have a redemptive mindset. They're not just looking for transfer growth. They're not just looking to, to cater to a, a group of people. They are looking to rebuild. They're looking for those burnt and broken stones that are in society, and they're saying, we have to reach them. We have to reach them. We have to find a way to reach them. It's not going to be the same for you as the same for somebody else because your community is a little different, right? You're in an industrial area. It's going to be a little bit more difficult, but it's not impossible. I mean, you've got a great facility here. You got room to grow. You got a parking lot. Man, when I, when I came and pastored the Northeast Church, we didn't even have a parking lot. Just gravel. I found out the first Christmas we were there that, that it was on a septic tank and, and a cistern. And how did I find that out? Yeah, I found that out because... On Christmas Eve, when we were about to have our service, the septic tank overflowed because someone had shut off the alarm under the kitchen sink because they didn't know what that beeping sound was. <laughs> Generally, it means something. And as I showed up to make sure the preparations, I, I was like, what is that smell? Of course, that was a rhetorical question because I knew what it was. I just didn't know where it was coming from. Then I realized that the snow was kind of discolored, and so I kicked around. I found a lid. Oh, no. Now on Christmas Eve, i got to try to find a guy that will come and pump out a septic system. So you start the phone, and finally I get this guy, and he goes, you know what, I'm a Christian. I'll be there in 10 minutes. Hallelujah. It was impossible. But he came. You know, I had to run 400 feet of garden hose to another building that the same guy that owned our building owned so that I could get water into the cistern so that we actually had water in our service so people could flush the toilets. Which, of course, wouldn't have helped if I couldn't have got the tank. So anyway, we believe. We believe 
that God is able. But we, do we believe that we are able to follow his lead and do what needs to be done? Understand, I, I, just, I take a look at this and I go, I, I've just been told many times not to get my hopes up too high. Don't put too much expectation on people. Oh, my goodness. Don't put too, what is too much? I haven't found a measure for that yet. I guess when they break down sobbing from exhaustion, I don't know. But at the end of the day, when, when people, are, people are hungry for the cause, it just it seems like you can't wear them out. They just want to get in there. They want to do. They want to be there. And, and trust me, I've started a lot of things from scratch, and I've taken things over. I know what it's like to transition. I know what it's like to plan. I know what it's like to do those things. And my goodness, there's nothing easy about it. And it doesn't matter how big or small the group is. When I went to Lethbridge, we had 800 people. No pastors, but 800 people. Try to rebuild that. How, how do you do it? No money? No pastors? It was like, well, well. It seems impossible. But over the next year, two years, pretty soon we had an associate and then a children's pastor. And, you know, we, had, we had 175 children in our Sunday school, and we didn't have a children's pastor. Yeah, that's when I hired Pastor Matt Funk, who just, <laughs> he didn't even know anything. Wasn't a pastor, had no Bible school, but he was eager. And I thought, this is what this is going to take, is somebody who's eager. And so understand that there's, you, you have to get people who will bite in. And so you have to be sure what God wants you to do. You know, and I, I just wrote this quote, and I don't even know if it makes sense to you or not, but it makes sense to me. And it says, I'd rather believe God for much and settle for less than believe him for a little and get everything my faith provides for me. Understand that, that, I, that I've believed God for big things and he said, you can't handle that, but I'll give you this. I'd rather settle for what he's willing to give me than to say, oh, I don't believe this can work and get exactly what I was believing for. I understand that, that we need to be people who believe for big things and, and God will give us what we can manage, but I'm going to believe him for more than I can manage because then that drives me to be better, to push higher, to push further. So quickly in the last few minutes, I'm going to give you four truths about building the local church. Number one, people never know what they're capable of doing until they're put under pressure. You never know what you're capable of doing until you're put under pressure, okay? Because the fact is diamonds are made under pressure. You know that it takes heat and pressure to make good steel. You, you can't make good steel without heat and pressure. They had to heat it up and hammer it down, heat it up and hammer it down. And it puts temper in it and it strengthens it. And so there's that. We just never know what we're capable of doing until we're under that pressure, so far too often, people are just looking for something comfortable. If you're looking for comfort, you're not looking for the church. You're looking for a religious society that just says, okay, we're just going to come get together. And we used to have a church. It was actually planted out of this church many, many years ago. And I had to meet with the pastor. There was just some issues, and I met with the pastor, and I sat down with him, and I I guess, what do, you, what do you feel about our vision? Like, are you in line with the vision? What do you, how do you feel about that? And he said, no, we're not actually in line with the vision. We just believe that we're, we're just going to be a small church of really mature people all gathered together. I said, what about the community? Irrelevant. I said, well, you know, you just don't seem to fit with us then. He said, okay. And they disassociated with us. I don't know what ever happened to them, never followed up. But they didn't have a heart for the lost. They wanted mature people to come in so they could all sit around and talk about the Bible. That's, see, that's a home group. That's not the church. The church is an army. The church is a battleship. The church breaks down barriers and walls. The church stops the gates of hell. This is a message that Jesus wants us to get a hold of. So you never know what people are capable of until they're put under some pressure. And number two, the level of our confidence in God will dictate people's expectations on us. So what do I believe God can do? Because that's the expectation people are going to put on me. If I say I believe God can do this much, 
And people are going to be expecting me to do that much. But if I believe that God can only use me to do this much, nobody's going to follow me because they don't just want They want to follow somebody that's going to do this much. They want to press forward. They want to get a hold of something, a dream, a vision, and get some passion in it. You see, if we aren't confident that God can use us, then we cannot expect anybody else to be confident that God can use us. We have to know. Nehemiah had to know that God was with him and that God could use him when he was going to that wall. When he was going there, he had to know, this is God sending me and he's going to provide me everything I need to do this job. And as impossible as it seems right now, and as difficult as I know it will be, I know that one day I'll stand on that wall and it will be done. It will be done. And we have to approach everything we do for God that way. Because he's not going to ask us to do something that we can do ourselves. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way at all. If you want to really move mountains, it takes faith. And even though it may be as a mustard seed, it says, just think about the potential that is there. And then, of course, number three, we'll only rise to the challenge when we understand the purpose and embrace the vision. We'll only, we'll only come up to that level when we understand what's going on. That's why many times you'll have people will walk through the door and sit down and go, yeah, I don't know what's happening here, but I'll just go somewhere else where it's exciting. They got an incredible light show. Wow, you know, I had five worship teams. You know, I, I almost think that's sinful. If you have five worship teams, you should be planting five churches. Because if you've got five worship teams, you've probably got at least five pastors in that place sitting waiting to be released. You know, we were starving for a drummer. You know, when the Donauders released their church to me in, in Chilliwack, you know, they took the whole worship team. You know, they were the worship team. They took the whole worship team. And, and so we're trying, we're scrambling, trying to bring people together. And, and of course, Caleb, their brother-in-law, became our, our worship leader at the time. And, and so he had to move from playing the drums to playing the guitar and giving some lead. And so we were looking for a drummer. And we found out there was a church in our city that had seven drummers on a rotation. I wanted to go over and bang some heads. We're looking for a drummer, but they wouldn't release one. No, because we need all those drummers. You know, what do you need seven drummers for? Man. So I started thinking, they got seven drummers. How many pastors do they have over there? Well, according to them, just one. The boss. And he's still the boss. And they have still never released anybody. They've still never, oh, they got a big fancy building. And when I ask people why they go there, they go, oh, wow, they got an incredible worship team. Well, I guess so, they got seven drummers. <laughs> How many guitar players do they have? Understand, and so we'll only rise to the challenge when we understand the purpose. And if God sends you seven worship teams, you better be thinking about where you can put seven churches. And if you've got ten pastors sitting there, then you better find out what God wants you to do with those people. Male, female, I don't care. Get a stake in the ground and plant somebody there. Let's get this job done. Because the gates of hell are barking at us. Are we going to stand firm like Jesus and say that they will not prevail against us? Because they sure want to. They're burning down the churches now. Number four is we'll only invest to the level of vision that we embrace. We only invest to the level of vision we embrace. If we really, really, really believe what our church is called to do in our community, then we'll rise to that level and invest. That's what we'll do. If we're just looking for a place to be comfortable, then everything just becomes optional. But when we really embrace the vision and take a look at it, then we're willing to dig deep. Now, this is more than just offerings. It's more than just money, but it does include those things. But it, it, it takes our time. It takes our talent. It takes our ability. It takes everything we have pouring into that. And I am here to tell you, when you will do that and take it from someone who has started from nothing, 
When you can do that, you can do something. You can get somewhere. You know, we started our church in High River. It was my brother-in-law and a couple other guys and myself sitting around a kitchen table going, this is what we need to do. And the guy that was, the, the, was sitting at the table that could play a guitar, he was going to be the worship leader, and he was stuck in country gear. And we needed to get out of country gear. We needed to get something more contemporary. And so we began to believe for that. And one day in our service, which was still in his house at the time, we were trying to get him, Dave was his name, to, to, to play more of an upbeat contemporary type song, but he was stuck in this gear. And there was this young lady there and, and she could see that he was struggling and then when he got frustrated and stopped playing, she finally said, you know what, I, I just think you have the melody a little wrong on that song. And being a little bit of a male chauvinist, he peeled off his guitar and he handed it over to her across the coffee table and he said, if you think you can do it, have at it. And she went, oh, okay. And so she put her foot up on the coffee table, she grabbed that guitar and she banged out that song and worship erupted in the place. And when she was done, she handed him his guitar and said, I think it goes something like that. <laughs> and all the women in the room went, yes. And we had a new worship leader. Understand that, that she bought into our vision and they invested in it. Her and her husband, her family, her husband hadn't gone to church for years. Next thing you know, he was our head usher. See, Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there's no revelation, the people cast off restraint. That can, of course, be translated as vision, where there's no vision, the people cast off restraint. They, they have to have vision to buy into you got some great, young, vibrant pastors here. I'm telling you, the family that Beth comes from is committed to the gospel. I don't know Dustin's family. I'd like to meet them, but I know he's committed. I know where he's come from. I've been watching him for years. I know where he's at. Understand, he didn't come here because he wanted to get rich. He came here because he wants to do something wants to do something. He wants to build something. He wants to develop something. And I think they're just worth investing in. I think they're worth investing in. I think they're worth getting behind. I think the vision is worth it. You've certainly got the foundation here to, that you can build upon. You know, I, I tell you what, we got pastors across this country that would sacrifice at least two of their teeth to get this building. <laughs> Maybe a couple of fingers and a foot. I don't know. But they're meeting in rental facilities that they got to be out of. Understand, you got a great opportunity. And yeah, maybe there's some burnt and broken stones, but it, and it looks impossible some days. But guess what? You embrace it. You give it to God. And the next thing you know, you're overcoming it. My takeaway today, you and those around you will only reach the height of your highest expectations expectations on God, yourself, and those serving the cause. Let's pray together. Why don't we stand? Father, we worship you today. We thank you, Lord, for being here with us. Oh, Lord, I just know that, that this church was planted with, with great expectations. It was planted with a tremendous amount of fanfare, Father. And I don't think that your plan for this church has ended. I believe, Father, that you still have great plans for people who will have great expectations on you. And so, Father, we commit this ground into your hands and we prophesy to it, Father, in Jesus' name. We command this part of Edmonton to yield its best. We command, Father God, these seats to be filled with committed people, Father God. And we prophesy to this area that there is a whole new spirit about to fall on it. And we just thank you, Father, for opening those doors. And we just bless you each and every day. I thank you for Pastor Dustin and Pastor Beth. I thank you, Father God, for ministering to them and giving them the insight and the wisdom that they need, Father, to 
do the work that is set out before them. And even though it might have looked impossible, and I know there's days it's been difficult, Father God, I look forward to standing here one day with them when it's done. And so, Father God, we commit it into your hands today. And I thank you for the people that will rally with them and pour out, Father, and give what they can to build something great. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you all.